Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my wonderful co-host, Kiana Holloman. What's going on, Kiana? Hi, Chief. It's good to see you. Good to see you again. This is this is number two for the week. It is. It's a hot week. It is, <laughs> it, is it is. But you know, when we have two guests, we get, that means we got some super special guests. So uh, without further ado, uh, Kiana, please introduce today's guests. Today's special guests are Army leaders with more than 60 years of service combined. Both men have received numerous awards throughout their careers, including four Bronze Star Medals, multiple Legion of Merit Awards, and the Army Distinguished Medal. They are here today to share more about their roles and support of the Army and to provide a quality of life update to the military community. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Deputy Chief of Staff G9, Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen, and his Senior Enlisted Advisor, Sergeant Major Michael Perry. Hey! So that's that's our that's our five dollar production budget right there. We got a hand clap <laughs> <laughs> and all kind of things. So so thank you so much uh, <laughs> for you all being on the show today, uh, Lieutenant General Vereen, Sergeant Major Perry. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Can you let our viewers know uh, where you're joining us from? Awesome. Well, uh, we're not in the the Pentagon right now. We're actually in the Taylor Building. Um, so, um, you know, it's good to be here. We've got another organization uh, that we're responsible for. So we uh, took the time to, you know, to really do two things here. Uh, one, to see our, our unit, but also to do, you know, the uh, interview from here. So we're excited. Yeah. Well, well, I want to apologize because I know y'all are never trying to get out of the Pentagon. Everybody loves to stay there all, all day long. So, so my apologies, <laughs> but I want to thank you all for, for kind of making those adjustments uh, to, to be on the show. No, and we're excited to have you both here as well. So could you both give us an overview of the Army's commitment to enhancing the quality of life of its service members? Yes. Okay. So I'll start, uh, and then I'll let Sar Major. He can he'll talk to as well. Yeah. So so first, uh, you know, I think it starts with our Army senior leadership. Um, we we are really um, you know focused on on people, and uh, the Army has this mantra, you know, people first. And you know, from the Secretary of the Army to the Chief of Staff of the Army, you know, people are the centerpiece of you know of all that we do, and we understand for us to attract. Um, and to retain, you know, quality across the Army. And I don't care if it's um, those who are wearing a uniform or if it's our Department of the Army Civilians and our families, you know, we have to ensure that quality of life is the, at the forefront of all that we do. And, and so we understand that uh, in this day and age, you know, when we are really strapped for ensuring that our, our Army's manned properly uh, and that we retain and we, you know, and we recruit properly, um, that we do everything we can to ensure a helpful and, you know, a wholesome quality of life for our soldiers and our families. And they all are, you know, one and the same. We don't say that our soldiers just have to have great quality in the workplaces where they work, but our families have to have good quality of life and good programs for their children as well. So um, we take it on. We, we are very uh, passionate about what we do. So that's kind of at least from you know, the startex of, of how we get our marching orders and what we're really focused on. So our major. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, Chief, again, thanks to you and your team for uh, providing General Vereen and myself an opportunity to spend some time with you all today. You know, as General Vereen said, obviously, uh, you know, the, the challenges that all the services are facing right now to bring on a quality, uh, you know, a family member and, and service member, regardless of what service is, is critical uh, to the defense of our nation and then being able to retain uh, those individuals once they choose to to join and to serve in any of our services uh, and then when you think of the term quality of life you know that that's actually very broad and vast and so just quickly you know that includes things like spouse employment uh, you know child care housing and barracks MWR uh, health care uh, you know those are some different things that when you look at quality of life and then really for us soldier and family programs as well uh, which is you know they're on the installation or offside a lot of our service members live off the installation 
you know, how are we uh, creating programs that are going to, uh, you know, support them and their families as they support us? So those are just a few things about quality of life. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and I'm super familiar with this this topic. Uh, I think that there's all, there's a saying that they say we recruit individuals, but we retain families. And uh, and I know, uh, you know, G9 is, is specifically into this retaining the family and, and doing all the different uh, priorities that y'all have. Are, are hot topics in any service so across the board so uh you definitely you know ha have a you, you definitely have a challenge uh but but a good challenge because you, you're doing things to, to in, you know increase the, the 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 quality of life and all the different things that kind of keep families together so we appreciate that yeah thanks Chief. so let, let's let's talk about some of those priorities of uh, you know sorry major perry what are the what are the initiatives that focus on supporting army families uh, and can you, can you really, I, I kind of want to get a uh, take from both of you all, any specific examples of quality life initiatives that have made a difference in your life personally uh, throughout your career? No, oh, thank you, Chief. And so, you know, I'll start out with housing and barracks. Um, you know, obviously a lot of our service members uh, that they actually, you know, they're, they're, they don't have a family. Uh, they live in, in uh, unaccompanied housing, as we call it. And then, of course, uh, you know, for those families, uh, that are assigned to an installation, then uh, the only about 35% actually reside on the installation in Army family housing. Uh, and then the majority live out there, you know, in, in the communities uh, that are outside of our, our camp stations and post. And so, uh, you know, our Army senior leaders have really put a lot of emphasis in ensuring uh, that, that we have quality housing uh, for our service members. And we do this in a couple different ways. Uh, one, we have partnered uh, with privatized companies that, you know, specialize in, and there's six of them for the Army that provide, you know, high quality housing uh, on the installation. Uh, and then we've also got some some government owned housing as well that we still have. And so, um, candidly, you know, the, the, the Army uh, about 2018, 2019 or so, we, you know, we had some challenges um, that, that, you know, really caused the Army senior leaders uh, to really look much closer to figure out, you know, um, are we are we doing everything we can to make sure that the houses that they're getting provided uh, by these partners are, are quality and over while it's not perfect. Definitely. I think there's been a lot of strides and a lot of improvements made in, um, you know, providing uh, our, our service members and families an opportunity to provide feedback, uh, you know, through tenant satisfaction surveys directly to, uh, you know, those privatized partners. Uh, which ultimately gets all the way up to Army senior leaders. And then we make decisions uh, on, on how to ensure that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're working with those partners to do that. And then when it comes to our barracks, um, this, is a, this is a big challenge for us. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, a, a lot of barracks out there that unfortunately uh, a lot of our infrastructure is, is older. And so, uh, you know, how do we balance, you know, with, with our budget, um, you know, building new barracks, uh, you know, which we call MILCON, military construction, but then also looking at the barracks that exist that are still very solid in nature. And then, you know, how do we do uh, restoration and modernization to improve, uh, you know, the overall quality of life to, uh, versus how maybe they were designed 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and so those are just a couple of things that we're doing specifically with barracks um, and, and, and housing. And, and, you know, for me personally, you know, I lived in the barracks as a, as a young private 31 years ago in Alaska, and then my family and I have lived on army family housing as well. So that has definitely impacted me. Yeah. Hey, okay, so I'll, I'll talk two things. Um, one is childcare. Um, childcare is a big deal for the army and just like all the other services, you know, and, and our families want to have safe, you know, affordable childcare where they can go home and, or go back or go to work and know that their children are going to be cared for safely in a safe environment uh, and we're going to have qualified experts caring for them and so child care is one of the focus focal points for, for the army because we understand that you know in this day and age we have a lot of dual military families and we have dual you know employed families where you have both spouses are working and so um, child care is a big deal and we want to make sure that you know for us we have the capacity to be able to house uh, and care for, you know, for the children across the Army. You know, currently we have a, a deficit in, uh, in, I think, in the capacity when you look at the workforce and we're doing, you know, some wonderful things trying to increase the, the employee base across all of our, our CDCs. But that is one area that we're extremely focused on. And then the, the second piece to that is expanding uh, opportunities when we look at, you know, family um, child care 
uh, homes that where we have, you know, homes that are that are uh, on the installations where spouses, you know, who have a, a, a great desire and, and a love for, you know, caring for children uh, to be able to do that and make some, you know, make some income too as well. So, uh, and then the flexible hours, as you all know, I mean, you know, in, in the different services, we have folks who work, you know, shift work um, and, and shift work goes 24 hours, you know, across the, across the spectrum. And there may be, you know, uh, a wide uh, amount of, you know, men and women who have to work at night and we want to be able to have opportunities where we do have available childcare for them. So that's one. And then the second piece, uh, and uh, I'll talk about a spouse employment. Uh, we are, we are on a, uh, uh, a mass um, sort of uh, adventure to expand spouse employment for, you know, for our military spouses. We all know that our spouses um, have a lot of uh, great skills. They have education, uh, they have careers. Uh, and, you know, and it, and it becomes a very emotional event when you have, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the time to, to have to PCS and, you know, spouses are debating whether they're going to PCS with the spouse because with the military member, because, you know, they have a great job. And so, uh, we're looking at, you know, how do we expand spouse employment with licensure opportunities, you know, reimbursables, uh, when it comes to expenditures for credentials and licensure, um, and PCS moves for our spouses as well. But we're also looking at, um, you know, a huge push for remote work uh, for our spouses. When you have great employees and you don't want to let them go uh, and their military spouses, um, there's opportunities now to keep them on board. And we can use remote work as an opportunity to be able to do that. Keep them on the roads, keep them uh, employed um, and uh, and get away from the stress and strains of, you know, having to, to move and find another job. So and, and I have been a product of both. Um, my spouse works and, uh, and I have had used childcare on our military installations. So, yeah, no, no, those, those are awesome, awesome, uh, initiatives and, 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 and talking points. And I, d I did want to highlight a couple of things that AFES does to kind of partner with you all, uh, for quality of life, cause we're in the quality of life business as well. And so, uh, for those that don't know, uh, when, when barracks are built, uh, the army barracks specifically, uh, we, we, we partner with you all to, to provide a Wi-Fi service. Uh, for those for those soldiers in the barracks, so uh, that's that's one one way kind of we we're trying to help out, and also with spousal employment, um, we we have uh, we have eighty five percent of our our associates are tied into the military in some form, about 40, roughly forty five percent of veterans and spouses, and so we got an initiative to hire uh, seventy five thousand spouses by two you know in the next five years I think is is the goal, um, and also with us. As you PCS, you can PCS from one base to another, and still uh, your your spouse will have a job going to the next location. So uh, we, we're like I said, we uh, I learned some a lot about uh, AFES, you know, working in this position uh, the past three years, and just how how we're how tied we are in with with the Army, Air Force, and the Space Force. So uh, thank you for that partnership, and we 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 love to take care of soldiers uh, all over the world. Uh, thank you, Chief. We definitely appreciate the support that APs provides. And those two examples, and then obviously, uh, you know, your guys' slogan, we go, you go, we go where you go. Uh, and Absolutely. so obviously many of us have been to the outstanding support you uh, provide to, you know, those service members that are that are still out there deployed and in some austere locations. So, so thank you again. Awesome. So another initiative of importance to the Army is financial readiness. So we had a chance to speak with Robin and Carolyn on your financial readiness team back in April, and they shared some amazing information just about how you all are supporting the financial success of soldiers and their families. So can you kind of highlight um, how the Army is supporting the financial well-being of soldiers and their families? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'll start with this one. And so I, this is one of the areas uh, that, that I've, I've been very intimately involved with since I've been in the G9, because um, uh, a lot of the, the things that you talked with Robin and Carolyn about is it's it's the financial literacy training that we created. Uh, that it was rolled out in October of 2021, I believe, based on an NDAA from 2016 that said, you know, told all the services you need to come up with some type of financial literacy training. Um, and really, this is a, a, a prevention measure. Um, we understand that a lot of the, the challenges that our service members and their families have, um, sometimes that root cause can be traced back to finances. And so uh, what we've done is created, and, and Robin has really been the champion for this, for the G9 and for the Army as a whole, is creating milestone training, uh, which at different points uh, in a young uh, soldier 
a soldier's career, you know, whether it's a PCS move, it's promotions, um, you know, there's just a variety of different milestones, you know, birth of a first child, you know, marriage. And so this milestone training is, is uh, designed, uh, it's an online thing through financialfrontline.org, phenomenal, uh, you know, website that has a wealth of resources that you do not need a cat card to access. You can access from any smart device. Um, and really, uh, Robin has put together some, some very modern uh, training and a bunch of tools and resources, uh, some that are OSD level resources and then some that are Army, more Army centric. Uh, that really, uh, you know, if our soldiers and service members and really our leaders get out there and, and knock the training out or complete the training that, that they're required to do as they hit those milestones, you know, we're confident that that will prevent, uh, you know, again, some significant challenges down the road that we all face as we hit those different points in our lives. No, no I think uh, Sergeant Major said it all. I mean, that's, you know, we, we value, I think, uh, the opportunity to be able to um, provide, you know, financial, you know, readiness and, and uh, enlightenment and, you know, and information for our, our soldiers and their families, especially our, our young soldiers and young families. I mean, that's that's important for them as they, you know, make um, financial decisions, you know, as they start off, you know, in a military career and, uh, and moving forward. So it's important. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm so I'm so glad that the Department of Defense really uh, start putting an emphasis on financial responsibility and financial management because you know I grew up in an environment where uh, I, I learned how to make money but not how to keep money and and uh, I, and I, I you know if you don't you didn't know I started off in the Marine Corps uh, before I was an airman and so um, yeah we, we did a lot of weird stuff with our money we, we lived like paycheck to paycheck we didn't really have anybody to unless you got with somebody that was uh, you know one of your your master guns or sergeant majors or, or first sergeants who who really kind of took you under their wing and tried to you know educate you otherwise you're just kind of out there on your own until you get in trouble and once you get in trouble that's when you start getting the financial management stuff or whatever the case may be so it was super reactionary uh, uh when i was coming up the ranks and so i'm glad we're being a lot more proactive on on how to you know how folks can you know manage their money a lot better i just i just, I just think this is a awesome uh, initiative that dod is really putting emphasis on Yeah, Chief, if I could just add one additional point. And so I think you hit a, a great point. Um, and this is where, yes, uh, you know, very thankful for OSD, the attention and the resources they put uh, towards this for all the services. Uh, and the training is great. Uh, but really, uh, another critical aspect of this is leaders at Echelon, you know, really, especially our non-commissioned officers. And, I, and again, I think this is universal across all the services. Um, it isn't just about completing some training. Um, it again, it's, it's almost that intrusive leadership, that caring leadership that our uh, that our non-commissioned officers have to on behalf of our officers uh, do in order to ensure that, um, you know, we're recognizing some of those signs uh, when things are, are potentially, uh, you know, are, before our servicers make, make bad decisions. And so the training is important. Uh, but again, those, those, those first line leaders all the way up through those sergeants majors uh, play a critical role in ensuring that we're, we're preventing, uh, you know, some, some bad decisions potentially from being made, uh, you know, so our soldiers and families can, can be financially ready, you know, which is mentally ready and, and ready to do whatever we need them to do. So thank you for, for highlighting that as well, sir. Yeah. Just, I just kind of want to say, say a quick story though. Um, so I was, a I I was probably about 24, 25 years old. Uh, and I had a, civilian uh gs gs7 gs9 i think she was and um she was looking at her tsp i i never heard of tsp to that point like it it wasn't a thing that we we talked about or whatever the case may be and so she was like you never heard of a tsp she's like you put your money in here and it's compound interest so she was trying to explain compound, compound interest to me and then so she was like okay well let me let you look at my tsp so i looked at her tsp she had thirty five thousand dollars. i had never seen $35,000 on anything, you know, just up until that point. I'm just like, I was like, man, you, and, and she's like, yeah, I've been doing this for about maybe four or five years. And so uh, at that point, I was, like I said, I was a young E5. Uh, she said, I put 10% of my, my check goes to my TSP. And then of course I think GS, they match it up to a certain percent. And so from that point on, I was like, you know what? I want $35,000. So let me, let me, so I, I immediately went in, she walked me through the process and I, I started, uh, I said, you're going to do 10%. I'm going to do 15%. So I did 15% from 24 and I've been living off 85% of my check, uh, since then. And so, but if I wouldn't have had that, 
that conversation with, like you said, that in, in leadership that, that kind of cared about me, that wanted to show me something. Cause you know, I was young, so you had to show me. It's like you could you could talk to me and give me all the training, but she showed me on paper, like, okay, no, nah, she's got money, money. It's like, okay, cool, I, I can get with that. So that sure. that helped me a lot along the way. No, that's amazing. And I want to say once again, the Army is setting the standard by implementing such a great program for financial readiness. Immediately after the um the interview with Robin and Carolyn, I went and stuck out a financial advisor so I could get my business together. I'm a civilian, but I'm an army rat. But thanks again. I know Chief's probably going to kick me off for saying that, but go on. Oh, no, no, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no. no I, they, they said, they said we, I'm the rib of the army anyway, so it's it's all good. I, I'll be the rib. Just just put some barbecue sauce on it. I'm good. <laughs> No, that's awesome. So in addition to the financial, housing, and child care aspects of quality of life, what resources and support systems are available for single service members? Yeah. Um, so I'll start. I So we, we have um, we have two um, really good programs. One is uh, Army Emergency Relief. I mean, that, um, that, that program does a lot for our soldiers, especially in a time of, of crisis uh, and a time of need. Um, but it does a lot more. I mean, you know, it does, um, it provides opportunities when, you know, folks need, you know, they, they, they need money for, to pay rent uh, or they need money for their car note. Um, they need, in some cases, some of the educational requirements that, you know, that they may not necessarily have funding for. It, it, AER does that and it provides, you know, money and time of need and so we're, we're really uh thankful for our army emergency relief and what it does for our soldiers i think the second thing we have is um, another program that we have is under um the association of the united states army and uh we you know it's known as AUSA. Uh, this organization does a lot of, of um, assistance for soldiers at, at any rank and any echelon uh, for for the army and it, of course it does a lot of the um you know, interaction and, and advocating for things on the Hill with regards to certain programs and certain uh, policies. And it's our it's our arm, our extension uh, that helps us um, be able to get some things done to take care of our soldiers uh, and our families. And so so those are two organizations that really provide a lot of s assistance and support uh, to soldiers and and their families uh, when things uh, kind of come awry and you have a time of crisis. That, ex that we all experience at some point in time of our, in our, in our military career. So. Yes, sir. And, and uh, you know, really quick uh, with AER as well, going back to this financial literacy training, one thing we really appreciate that they've done is partnered with us to uh, help, um, you know, candidly incentivize uh, our service members to, to complete this financial literacy training. And so what they did was they created, you know, basically I think it was about eight to 10 videos you go through the videos and then you take like a 25 question test. And if you hit a certain score on that, if you had an existing AER loan, and if you're a, I believe it's an E5 and below, then they reduce that loan by $500. And then if you're an E6 and above, uh, then they reduce it by, I believe, 250. And so it's a significant amount of, of again, it, it just by taking some training, um, which is going to help you, but also actually reduces your debt. Uh, that AER already helped you out in a tough situation anyway. So AER is, is truly for, for us been a great partner, you know, in the midst of COVID, uh, they really had to come up with some creative ways. There was some new things that they never really had to provide assistance for. Uh, and, and they were willing to, to um, you know, again, be creative and visionary in how they supported the needs of our service members and families. And then one additional thing uh, going back to how we help our single soldiers is called a uh, boss, better opportunity for single soldiers. And so this is a program that exists uh, at every uh, camp station and post across the Army. And, you know, usually what you'll have is at the installation level, a boss president. This is usually a young soldier, uh, a y very young NCO that, that's single. Uh, and what this program does is, is uh, you know, it gets dedicated resources and um, it will create opportunities for to bring our senior so uh, single soldiers together 
where we're, we're building and sharing camaraderie, uh, but they're able to go out and do, you know, events either on the installation via our MWR um, or out there, uh, out in the communities at a significantly reduced rate. And so it's just a, another uh, finance or a great program uh, that really helps, uh, you know, our young servicemen and women, um, you know, get out of the barracks and, and bosses for, you know, you could be a single parent, uh, uh, you know, it could be a jail bachelor or, or a bona fide, you know, single soldier. So it, it encompasses the full spectrum of, um, you know, uh, single soldiers. And so, again, another great program uh, that's there for our soldiers, single soldiers specifically. Yeah, no, I've, I've got a chance to brief some. Uh, uh, I, w I went to a particular uh, installation and got a chance to brief the, the boss program or the, the boss team uh, and to get feedback on how we can get better as an organization. So I, I love talking to. Uh, the, the young folks and, or single soldiers or, or, or whoever wants to give us feedback to, to kind of make us better. And I also want to give a plug to, to AER as well, because uh, we partner with AER. Uh, every time you you check out, uh, uh, whether it's self-checkout or if you go going through online, they ask you, do you want to donate a dollar to uh, AER, which has helped mm -hmm. the program tremendously. And like I said, AER is super flexible. They flex, they flex to what's going on in the world. And so it, they're not really bound by a lot of... Uh, red tape if they need to help soldiers they're, they're helping soldiers so I, I i love to see those organizations we have a similar organization called uh, air force a society or air force assistance fund that does the same thing so uh you know military i mean i've i've been in the military past 26 years and uh if, if there's any type of affliction i've ever had they've always had something to support me you know uh whether, whether it's financial or or you know i'm going through a rough patch or whatever the case may be so it's it's awesome to 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 know that you are you are the leaders of the of the army that are getting those getting after those uh those those tough issues. We appreciate that. So, uh, no, sorry, Major Perry, you you, you, thanks, Chief. So you did so you did mention uh about we go where you go, and so we know we got uh, service members deployed all over the world. Uh, they're they're away from their family. So can can you tell me how the army assists service members and families during uh deployments and separations? No, a a absolutely. And so, you know, it, it definitely starts well before uh, the service member has to leave. Um, you know, uh, you know, we've got a very uh, structured training plan and, you know, we go through, a, you know, a, a series of, um, you know, making sure we're medically ready, financially ready, uh, making sure our service, our, our service members, families that are going to, you know, typically stay back at that camp station or post uh, while that service member is gone. Um, you know, really understands all the resources that are there, you know, within the community, uh, through the garrison, through Army community service. And so it, it, it's really about just, uh, you know, and then we got the, um, uh, what do we call those, the uh, family, famous support groups, yeah. right? And so this is where, uh, you know, uh, spouses of, of, you know, whether it's a, an officer or, or an NCO, uh, within that organization, company, battalion, brigade, whatever size element that is, uh, that they will uh, ensure that they're keeping that connective tissue. It's a source of information. It's a source of community. Uh, and so those are some things that we're doing, uh, you know, again, before the deployment, uh, while the deployment is going on, and then also uh, helping with that reintegration. You know, obviously, we don't do a lot of the combat deployments that we've experienced, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria for all those years. But, you know, we've still got uh, sole service members deployed, I think, to 184 different countries right now for from the Army alone. Uh, and, you know, in Europe, in the Pacific, um, you know, all over. And, and so, uh, you know, those service members typically are not with their families. And so while they're gone for typically six or nine months, um, you know, that reintegration process is so important to ensure that, um, you know, again, we've got the resources, uh, family life counselors that are there to kind of help as that reintegration, which obviously is a very joyous occasion when you're bringing a family back together, but it can be a time of stress as well. So those are a few things that we do, Chief. Yeah. Sir? Yeah. So um, I'll just uh, add two things. One, uh, you talked about family support slash family readiness groups, um, but it, it is also important that we have good leadership that stays back. And so sometimes when we deploy, we like to take you know everybody with us and we understand that we do have stay back. Uh, we do have folks who have to stay back in that are that are, you know, that are assigned. These are leaders in the formation that may not necessarily deploy. So you got to it's a um, you know, it's a there's a cost to doing business. And so that cost is having, you know, good leaders that can stay back, that can deal with some of those unique challenges that, that may arise and families may encounter. So um, it's a sacrifice for a unit. But we want to ensure that we have good leadership back kind of taking care of that that unit and the families that remain there. The second piece is. 
you know, it's all about also having the resources in time of need. You know, we understand that families don't necessarily like to be bothered all the time uh, when, right. you know, even when your service members are deployed, you know, so you're managing, you're trying to temper, you know, how much interaction you have with them, but it's also making sure they have resources when they need them. They don't need everything every day. They don't need anything in some days. And so, you know, you don't necessarily need to be overbearing, but you got to be able to have, I think, the um, the availability of the resources when they need them. It's always important uh, when you need them, not necessarily important when you don't need them. So that's the thing that we, uh, we we really focused on is making sure that they have the resources when they need them, not necessarily all the time. So. Great point. Great point. And um, also mental health is such a important focus as well. You know, we just came out of 20 year, over 20 plus years of war. Then we then we get into covid and then it got some type of it's the social divide. It seems like in the country, it just all kind of things going on that, that put a, a not a lot, you know, let alone just regular life in a, in, a, in a soldiers, you know, whether it's marital problems or whatever the case may be. Uh, so mental health is just uh, it, it is super crucial to the readiness of, of our forces. So, so can you kind of tell us any about, about any specific programs and initiatives that the Army has for mental health? Yeah, so uh, so this is great. I mean, because uh, part of this is in the uh, in the building that we uh, that we are here right now. I mean, we have, um, you know, our our Army Resilience uh, Directorate. Um, and so what we are really focused on and Sergeant Major kind of hinted on it around the surface is we understand that, you know, that mental health is absolutely critical to the readiness of our force. And we want our soldiers, our leaders, you know, our Department of Army civilians to be able to, you know, do what we they're required to do and but also have the necessary resources to be able to continue to maintain themselves, you know, when it comes to the mental health piece. But I think when we are looking holistically at some of the things that, you know, that, you know, maybe are factors to, you know, to mental health and to some of the other factors we have, you know, when we term as harmful behaviors in the Army, you know, we understand that this is not necessarily, you know, one thing doesn't necessarily mean that's the root cause. And so, you know, we talk about try to, trying to build, you know, a community of, of health around our soldiers um, and, you know, and, and of course our family members and really understanding that equipping them with the resources that they truly need and not necessarily thinking that, you know, we've triaged one, you know, sort of cause to a certain problem. So Sergeant so Major talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things that we are seeing that, you know, may cause, you know, different reactions and folks may not necessarily be, you know, the root cause. For instance, you know, behavioral health and some of the things we're seeing in behavioral health uh, and and the, the nuances of why some of our you know soldiers behave a certain way, it may not necessarily mean that they need to see a chaplain or they may be experiencing mental health issues, but it could be financial issues or it could be you know just you know uh, you know family you know family network issues and things of that nature, so or relationship issues. So we're really starting to get after preventive, you know, when it comes to behavioral health and comes to anything that you know presents sort of you know, a different, you know, outcome or a different way that our soldiers are behaving, then we're really trying to, you know, get after what is, what are some of the things that we can provide that, you know, may not even, you know, lead them to do certain things that are probably, you know, adverse to their own well-being or the well-being of others. And that's the whole prevention piece that we're trying to really promote and, and trying to uh, move to us to another level. Because we understand that, you know, everything is not necessarily um, tied to a mental issue. Um, or that's causing behavior adversely, it, it could be other, you know, things that are driving that. So hopefully I kind of. Yes, sir. And if, yes, sir. if I could just talk well. Um, and so, you know, really, when you look at, uh, you know, behavior health, mental health professionals, and this is a, a national shortage, right? This isn't just a, a you know, an army problem. Um, you know, we, we just, uh, there, there is a, a, a shortage of, of those um, professionals that, that can, that can support uh, you know, uh, you know, service members or their families um, in that in that space. And so one of the newest initiatives that we're actually implementing across the Army right now is an annual wellness check. Um, and so this is a, a new initiative. And so, you know, before, whenever, you know, somebody would potentially say, I've got a problem, you know, I may need to go to talk to somebody, we were immediately sending them to behavior health, right? And if you look at it from like a triage perspective, 
um, you know, that was the most extreme, you know, um, you know, the most extreme cases and challenges is who needs to go see our, our no kidding behavior health professionals. But this is where, you know, first of all, again, leaders uh, and their role and their responsibility and getting to know their soldiers and just being able to sometimes just talk to them. And if it's a financial issue, then we don't need to send them to behavior health. You know, we help them, you know, better understand how to manage their finances, you know, get loans from AER. Um, but, uh, you know, the chaplains is another great resource, uh, the, the MFLEX, the military family life counselors. And so, again, the, the leader responsibility when it comes to our service members and their families of really being engaged and understanding what's going on in their life personally and professionally. And then, you know, kind of making those initial assessments to say, OK, here's where I need to get you help. Uh, but it shouldn't automatically be to, you know, behavior health, because, again, we do have some uh, some service members that have some, you know, significant challenges. And we've got to make sure those resources uh, and appointments are available for for those and leverage the, the full spectrum again of all those other resources that we talked about. And so we're really excited about this wellness check uh, that that we're going to be implementing. Uh, and again, leveraging all the tools and resources that our commanders and leaders have uh, at our camps, posts and stations, chief. Awesome. Okay, so just switching gears to wellness and physical fitness. So your program or your initiatives, rather, they kind of encompass everything a soldier and their family needs, including being ready and being resilient. So what are some examples of recreational initiatives that contribute to the overall quality of life in the Army? Um, well, we, we value fitness. Uh, fitness is absolutely um, essential for our soldiers. Uh, we want to treat them like athletes. I mean, I think that's the focus um, for long-term viability in the Army, you know, understanding the demands that are placed on uh, an individual, a soldier, and what we are expecting them to do. I think if you go to a lot of our military installations, you will see that we have transformed a lot of our gyms. Um, they're now more holistic fitness. When we talk about um, the, the things we want um, our soldiers to be able to perform when it comes to uh, the combat fitness test. I mean, so we've really reshaped a lot of our fitness facilities. Um, but not only will you see that, um, a, a huge shift in what's in it, but you also see us talking about, you know, how to eat right, you know, the, the, uh, the fueling of your body and you know, proper meals and things of that nature, meal preparation uh, classes. I mean, we're, we're, we're teaching our soldiers how to, you know, how to prep their own meals um, and using, you know, the proper ingredients to, you know, to be able to prepare your own meal, meals. And, and we're seeing a lot of, you know, our young soldiers are really, really focused on that and they're excited about that. So I, I think that's some of the things that you'll see um, when it comes to um, the, the fitness piece and and how we've kind of changed uh, some of the uh, infrastructure on our post camps and stations. I think the other piece is um, we also fully in invest in our families. You know, our, our facility is not ne necessarily just closed off for, you know, for the service member or the soldier, but it is also accessible to our families. And, and so um, we, you know, you'll see a lot of our family members, you know, utilizing the facilities that, you know, that are there on the post camps and stations and, and, and they're available for them as well. I think the other piece, you know, in the, in the MWR role, we under, we also know that, you know, our children, you know, or, you know, we, we know that sometimes, you know, activity is good. It's a good thing for our kids. Um, it's a matter of keeping them off the, you know, PlayStations and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the video game, things of that nature, because um, we, we do in this country have a, an obesity problem. We have, you know, a young, you know, population who may not necessarily be, you know, at the level of fitness that we want them to be. So, um, as we look at our MWR programs and, you know, and offer sporting programs for, you know, for our children, it is it is going to be uh, important that we that we expand it. So we give them maximum opportunity um, to be able to enhance um, their athletic ability, but also their their overall physical fitness, um, whether they decide to serve in the Army or the military or any other service, uh, but just for life. I mean, these are these are life changes. Uh, and we want to be able to, to invest in them at a very early age. So that those are things to, you know, just a couple of things I wanted to address. Sorry, Major. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, it, 
is really what General Vereen just described, and we call it, you know, Army and military has got an acronym for everything, H2F, holistic health and fitness, right? And so it's all those different components, you know, spiritual, mental, physical, the nutritional, uh, you know, emotional, you know, so it's it's that the total uh, fitness, we can't just focus on one area. We really, we have a responsibility to make sure that we have resources, we have programs, we have facilities, uh, you know, that are there uh, on our camp stations and posts for the, for the soldiers and for the families. Um, you know, uh, so that we've, it, you know, General Vereen and I, during our travels across, you know, really the Army and different installations, you know, we've seen some phenomenal examples of, you know, some of the the, the, the CDCs, the, the child youth uh, uh, programs and facilities that they have out there uh, where they're really, uh, you know, creating, uh, you know, outlets uh, for our, our service members, families uh, specifically uh, to be able to take advantage of, of uh, you know, again, some of those resources. And now that we're, you know, schools out across the country, uh, you know, those those resources and those programs are absolutely critical because the parents still work. Uh, and so it's important for those, you know, our youth to have healthy, safe outlets. Uh, you know, I, I will share one of the places we went, it was just an awesome, um, you know, story was we went to a, a, a youth center and one of the workers there actually like 20 years before he was a military child and he went through that program, you know, then went, you know, became a, a man, you know, got an education and chose to come back uh, to, to really making an investment in the next generation of youth. And so we just thought that, and, it, and I know there's there's hundreds of examples like that. Um, and so that's really to me when, or for us, when it's a win, you know, when you can get, uh, you know, young men and women, our children uh, that sacrifice a lot to serve and to support our, our military careers. And when we have these great programs for them. And then when they choose, you know, as they become adults to come back and to continue to reinvest, it's really just an awesome cycle. And so uh, those are just some things that we're doing in that space. Yeah, no, no, you always have definitely invested uh, tremendously in fitness. I, I feel like every time I go on my, my travels to an army installation, I walk it, probably every every three steps. There's a Connex box with a whole bunch of ACFT uh, stuff in it. Right. And I feel like a first star is going to jump out from behind the box and make me do an ACFT on demand. So I'm like, man, let me let me get in my car and drive around it and not walk around because because those, those things are everywhere, man. Those little Connexes are all over the installation. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Oh, I love it. Oh, and for our viewers, um, whenever you step foot into an exchange store, multiple stores that we have do have a BeFit 360 concept shop. So we're offering hydration accessories, supplementation um, for their nutritional needs. Maybe it's protein, maybe it's creatine, who knows, but we have what you need in stores as well as online at shopmyexchange.com to support our warfighters readiness and resiliency. So check that out as well. Um, all right, so we talked about BOSS a bit ago and how that creates a community for our single soldiers, but what role does community engagement um, for the entire installation um, play in the Army's quality of life initiatives? Yeah, start uh, yeah so I'm just looking to me to start, so I, mean, I can start. <laughs> no, I can. <laughs> so first, first, uh, first of all, you know, it's a matter of um, having healthy dialogue, I think, with our families and, and our soldiers that live on uh, military installations. So it starts with the, the senior mission commander and the garrison command leadership. I mean, how they operate and and how they, you know, they, uh, you know, pick their schedules with regards to having venues where they can engage the community, you know, is absolutely important. And, and so that dialogue and that exchange and the the um, the ability to be able to um, welcome you know, healthy dialogue in forums where there are town halls and uh, you know where you bring in you know folks from not only living on the post but but also from the community leaders in the surrounding areas to be able to inform them of things that are going on on the installation that I think it starts there that that is where that's where the conditions are set because really it's about you'd be amazed that people just don't know everything that's going on on a, on a post camp camper station, but but that forum through town halls is really it's a stage setter and it really helps to get command teams off on a really good foot with the community around the installation, but also with the families living there. And then I think you know the other critical piece um, is you know what we do in the information space, whether it's you know online, social media, and the virtual space. We are really you know even at my level here in you know, the job that we have is you know, how do we inform, you know, the collective audience, 
our you know our constituents, which are our families and our soldiers, on everything that the army is doing, and you know, and and be able to provide you know a medium for information where they can you know they can actually pull valuable information and be informed and uh, and know what's going on. We struggle with that in the army. I'll just be honest with you. You know, one is there's probably a, an overabundance of you know of platforms where people go to and 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 uh, social media sites and sometimes you know things are just so uh, convoluted that you don't necessarily you know get the information that you need because the overabundance. But it's really you know, are we in the right spaces? You know, from an organization to be able to know where our you know our families are you know are looking. Um, it's almost like, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, where, where are they looking and are we there to be able to provide the valuable information um, that they're looking for? So that's the, that's, you know, those, are, I think, uh, two keys to success. I think when it comes to, you know, how we are integrating this whole information and being able to inform, you know, and keeping the dialogue healthy, it started with the commanders, but it's also having a very, very effective, you know, virtual, you know, campaign and social media space in the virtual space to be able to provide information. Um, that's very timely and, and it's important, you know, for our families and the communities. Sorry, Major. Yes, sir. Thank you. And so uh, just kind of pulling on that partnerships thread. And so that's actually one of the, you know, I guess you call it a division within the G9 uh, that we have. It's an entire partnerships division. And so what they do is they go out there uh, and, and they are a, a liaison uh, with, you know, the communities, with academia, uh, you know, outside our camp stations and posts. And it, it's so important because, you know, after 9-11 happened, a lot of our military installations became very insulated, uh, very closed off for all the right reasons. You know, it was about force protection. Um, unfortunately, that's probably had uh, somewhat of an impact on our ability to recruit, um, you know, from outside the community because people have maybe a misunderstanding or a misperception about, you know, what goes on, you know, within the military base. And so these partnerships are so vital because, you know, as we have a limited amount of resources to do all the things that we have to do and to provide a variety of services uh, for our service members, we, we really can't do it all. And so, you know, what we've been able to do with our partnership division is is get out there and build these relationships. And then actually it's an ICSA intergovernmental service agreement or support agreement. And what it, and it could be from, you know, helping with spouse employment, helping with child care, helping with fire and emergency services. Um, and then, you know, actually in Texas a few months ago, I was there uh, with the governor of Texas re representing on behalf of uh, General Vereen and Governor Abbott signed the largest IGSA that's ever been signed with Department of Defense. And this was something as simple as all those Texas roadways that, you know, go through and around military installations. Well, when it came to doing the patchwork and things like that, um, that's an, a significant cost. And we're, we're not designed to do that in the military. Whereas, you know, the, the Texas Department of Transportation has got vast resources. And so we are able to get this agreement signed and it saves a significant amount of uh, resources for all of those military installations across the state of Texas, which then we can reinvest into other things. And so, again, the, the relationship between uh, our local uh, officials, elected officials, um, and and the, the, the military leadership on the installation is really critical uh, for that, that entire community. Yeah, no, I, I just, I really, like I said, it opened my eyes. I knew there was goodness out in the, wor in the world. Uh, I've always kind of been a kind of optimist type of person, uh, optimistic type of person, but just be, being, doing this podcast and just hearing about all the different initiatives and, and then even outside partnerships that are doing stuff for the military that that most people don't even realize right and, and kind of what general rain kind of touched on was the communication piece is right it's, it's like it's communication overload then you don't know who the source is is a, is a source of reliable sources giving our folks information what platform are we should we be on the, the one that is controlling the world right now is TikTok, and we we, we don't have access to it mm -hmm. because it, for, for obvious reasons so it, it's just yes. communication is easy and kind of uh easy on paper but harder in execution because you got your you got you got your different different generations and how they receive information you know some people probably got the newspaper or time magazine or other folks are on you know scrolling up and doing all kind of other stuff so it's just it, it it's it's hard as a leader and i've you know like i said even when i was out in the units uh prior to this job just trying to communicate trying to say you know what we're trying to do this awesome thing for you here it is and 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 it's always somebody's gonna be like, well, I never knew about that. I never heard about that. 
and I was like, oh my goodness. So it's I understand the struggle. The struggle is definitely real. Yes, too. But, but 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 you you mentioned kind of technology, and so can you kind of throw some resources out there for our folks to to, to grab onto while while they're listening to this podcast? Yes. Um, so I mean, you want to kind yes, of? Sir, I'll start out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but one of the things we do, and 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 you know, you bring up some great points, Chief, is that um, you know people do communicate in a variety of ways, but I would say everybody except for General Vereen's got a smartphone. Um, and so, you know, so it's, it's uh, you know, <laughs> overall flip phone, right? That's the rest of us. Are up there. I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, the, the, the smartphones and how dependent we are on those devices. Right. And, and the reliance we have on apps. Right. Because really, no matter how young or how old you are, you know, we want to be able to tap a button and to get access to information. We don't even want to use Google anymore. Right. We want to be able just right. to just take some, but one of the apps that we've done uh, in partnership with MCOM is a digital garrison app. And uh, this digital garrison app is is there's they're unique to each installation while there's services that are offered, uh, you know, that are are similar across installations. Obviously, the phone numbers associated with them, the addresses, all those different things. And so these digital garrison apps are really a great resource uh, for our service members and families um, in order to as they're either at a camp station or post or they're getting ready to PCS to another one. You know, they have that ability to really access and start to do a lot of research about schools, housing, all those different things. What kind of resources uh, is there? Spouse employment opportunities. And so I would say Digital Garrison is a great one. And then uh, in conjunction with the G4, they created like a My PCS app. And so we know that can be a very stressful time for our service members. And so this app is also kind of a one stop shopping to be able to help uh, our service members and their families um, navigate, uh, you know, again, what is a very stressful time. Yeah, sir. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the last thing I would just tell you is we, you know, we have really sort of transformed in how we provide information, I think, to a broader audience. You know, we, we have our own, you know, social media site. Uh, you know, we do a really good job of talking to ourselves. It's one of the things I always say, the Army does a good job of talking to ourselves, but we don't necessarily do a really good job of talking externally. So, you know, so we've really tried to take our, our social media site to another level. And it's really about, you know, how many connective relationships that you have that really gets you outside of the army and so we've we've been able to leverage that through you know through a, a, a wide variety of different agencies and so it's about enhancing our social media site and and really making sure that people have access to it and know how to find it i think the second thing i'll just talk about is the power of qr codes um you know we are you know yes, we sir. try to put qr codes on all of our stuff where people can you know at least take a picture of it and you know and it takes us it takes them to a landing page that you know, has valuable information that, you know, maybe our information or a garrison sort of information that's readily accessible for them because we know that, you know, this generation now, that's, they take a picture of everything. I mean, hey, I just remember my first experience going into a restaurant. I'm like, where's my menu? I'm thinking I'm going to get, hey, you know, I want to be able to read my menu, you know, flip it back and forth. And and they like, you know, they pointed me thing and I, and I'm serious. I, you know, I tried to play it off like I knew what I was doing. I was like, and I'm looking around, like, you know, what is everybody else doing? And they started, and they're they're taking a picture of this thing. And I so, and I'm thinking I'm taking like a real picture. It was just funny for me to, you didn't know, you you zoom it on this thing and hit this little thing, and then you know this the menu will come on your phone. And you know, but but that was my first experience. So we really with QR codes. I'm like, man, this is very this is that fascinating. Was last week. So yes, you know, last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but you know, but the power of QR, QR code. So we are, you know, we're trying to at least go to another level, and that's that's been a big focus. So. Yeah, no, no. I, mean, I know me coming up in in, uh, in the Marine Corps. They told us if you didn't hear it in the formation, then it's not true. And so you, you just the the how time has just changed, and now you got to really yeah. kind of bring formation to everybody else, right? And uh, and have these reliable sources because, like I said, there's a lot of information out there. It just may not be yes. from a source that we wanted to come from, right? And so, so for yes. us, like I said, as DOD, Air Force Two, we we were behind times yes. on on this technology where folks can actually go and get information, and we're hearing stuff from all these different folks out there in the world that yes. may not be true, or may be true, or whatever the case may be. And you're like, well, I haven't heard this from my, I haven't got any email, my email, you know, it didn't come, and it, you know, we send out these blast emails all the time, or whatever the case may be, but just having somewhere to go where I can get some reliable information that's that's current too because staying ahead of information is tough too because as soon as something comes out man it goes to reddit or it goes to these 
Army WTFs or Airmen Senior NCO NCO, and you're like, hold on, man, I didn't get a chance to even digest it as a leader. How do I even react to it? Yeah. So it's yeah, it, it's it's a weird world we live in sometimes. Yes. Yes. Now, well, it's been so great speaking with both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to educate our viewers on the important work being done to support our nation's heroes. Before we say goodbye, where can viewers go to learn more about what your team does and get the assistance they need? I'll leave that to the Sergeant Major. He's got a good closing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we're, you know, the literally, and I would say go back to Google, right? But if you type in Army G9, um, you know, that will actually take you to, again, a our web page uh, that is, you know, outside of the CAC. So you do not need, you know, a, a, a DOD ID card. And as, as General Vereen mentioned, you know, I, and I really appreciate uh, his leadership the last year um, of really putting an additional emphasis on social media and, and the importance of telling, you know, not his and my story, but our story of what our collective team in the G9 does for service members. And there's, again, so uh, we've really put a lot of emphasis, you know, LinkedIn, you know, Twitter spaces, uh, obviously doing this with you, Chief, um, you know, and, and just uh, a, a variety of places. And, and so there there is no uh you know limit on their access to information and you know our team does a great job of keeping that information updated relevant uh because that's also very very important and so you know just for me in closing i, I before i turn over general green again chief you know really appreciate this opportunity uh to have us here and spend some time with you and your team um and not just what you did for us today but you know uh just your dedication to uh you know keeping uh, your viewers informed through a variety of, of different resources whether they're affiliated with the military or not so really just appreciate uh, what you do in this space, Chief. Yeah, and, and so my final comment is again. I mean, hey, Chief and uh, Kiana, we we want to thank you for inviting us. I mean, it's I know it, you know, it, 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 this was an act of you know Congress trying to get you know us in here and you know just, just trying to thank you to me. We had to postpone this thing, and you know it was you know it's just interesting dynamics to try to try to get us all together. But it's been very rewarding for us. Anytime we have an opportunity to be able to put our you know, our um, our message out there and inform the community of what we're doing. We don't necessarily get everything right all the time, but we are still trying to learn. And we're you know, the collaboration, I think, with all the other services makes us better. And not only service, but the external you know community writ large is a, is an opportunity for us to become better as an organization. So it's all about our people. I'll just uh, end it with that. And uh, our army can't be strong and it can't be the army that's going to win in anything that we do unless we have our people. Um, and they know that um, the Army has has their back. So, uh, again, we, we appreciate the time. No, absolutely, sir. And I just want to kind of, uh, you know, AFES kind of gave me this opportunity to to spread goodness in the world through this uh, this podcast. And I, I always try to uh, highlight uh, folks that are doing good stuff in the world. And I, I had the opportunity to talk to some amazing folks. But, you know, you're the G9 office, uh, man, it's you're probably at the forefront of most town hall meetings. I, I can imagine like it. You get a lot of feedback uh, at town hall, <laughs> town halls. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's a job that is, is very high, high vis and, and very important uh, to soldiers, family, to, to everybody that's uh, associated with the military. So I just want to thank you and uh, Sergeant Major Perry uh, for for your service and, and what you do for, for soldiers uh, and, and service members throughout the world. Because, I mean, what you do affects because we got airmen living we got airmen we got marines living on post camps and uh was that fort post and camps as well and so uh whatever yes. you do uh directly you know reflects on all of the military service so just thank you for your time uh i know it, it's tough to get an hour of a, a lieutenant general and a, and a sergeant major's time and i just I really appreciate even though we had a couple hiccups that's the technology part part we were talking about right you know it's it, it, it's, it's it's tough but but you know what you got you got some you know no, take it easy on those aides back there, sir. No, no. <laughs> they'll, they'll be all right. No, but I just, like I said, I, I love talking about this type of stuff. We we owe it to our our service members to to make sure if you're gonna if you're willing to sacrifice your life for this country, that we're gonna give you uh, the best way we can do on our side. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank, thank you, Chief. Chief. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, absolutely, Kiana. Thank you. And, so, and sir, if you don't mind hanging on until we're at, uh, finished with the live, till we can say our formal goodbyes. But uh, I just wanted to kind yeah. of thank you in front of our audience and just say appreciate your time. Uh, and, and Kiana, you are amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, and and the my team, I have an amazing team and our viewers out there at the Exchange World. So thank you so much. And, uh, and Chief, shout out.